Hello, you're listening to Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast, presented by Brandon Elliott. This show will be going over all aspects of real estate investing and is intended to educate, motivate, and prepare you to take action on your first or next real estate investment. For more information, please visit BrandonElliottInvestments.com. Thank you for listening and enjoy. Welcome back, everyone, to Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast. I am your host, Mr. Brandon Elliott. I'm excited today. We have a special guest from the East Coast, Philly, Philadelphia, for anybody out there that doesn't know Philly. And that's really cool because that's my home area, New Jersey. And I grew up going to Philly a lot for you know all of our home teams and all that stuff. But for real estate, we have an awesome boss lady in the house that has been crushing it. And after hearing a little bit about her story, it's really cool because you guys all know and you guys resonate with us utilizing and maximizing credit, the big difference between good debt and bad debt, leveraging credit to purchase properties, complete remodels, and getting secured so you're not getting screwed over by contractors, a whole nine. Uh, This woman right here has done the exact same stuff, been able to build up an awesome portfolio and doing all through the Burr strategy utilizing section eight, the whole nine. Very, very excited to have you on today. So what's up, Janelle? How are you? And how's life going? What's up? Life is going good. You know, I'm actually from New Jersey, but I moved to Philly. It's just because the market over here is cheaper. You know, Jersey taxes are crazy. It is. So, yeah. So because I didn't have any kids or anything to pay for that expensive school, I, I moved to Philly. And so then I discovered how great this market was for investing and then the rest is history. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I would have done the same thing. That's a smart move. I was crazy and I came all the way out to San Diego. Yeah. 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 The wrong direction. Yeah. Way more. I feel like California is for rich people. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. There. Yeah. When there's a will, there's a way. And I got crazy. Yeah. yeah, You can definitely figure it out. I mean, I would love to move out there one day, but I got to I'm going to make my money in Philly and then move to Cali. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. All I say is just don't visit out here because when I visited out here, a friend, just, just for a weekend, two months later, I was like committed and yep. I, I was all in. Yeah, uh, I've been there. It's like paradise. I love it out yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. But anybody out there that doesn't know exactly who you are, a little bit more of your story, do you mind just diving into your background? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I went to school for chemical engineering and I started investing in real estate the very same year I started working in 2004. And the way I started is my dad had a duplex in Philly and it was across the street from my grandmother's house. And while I was in school, and he had this duplex from like the 90s. So yeah. while I was in school, he'd actually let the property go and had been vacant for over 10 years. And my grandmother called me and told me it was about to go for share sale. And I went and I got a student loan and I paid it back taxes, about $5,000. So then I kind of forgot about it again. I graduated, started working. And then she called me again one day. She said, they're about to tear it down. And I knew this house was in really bad shape. It had been raining for years. The roof was terrible. The wall in the back was collapsing. It had broken joists, everything. And so they were going to tear it down. So I had to go and find out what the violations were as yeah. I was doing that. There was a contractor because this was in the building where they all go and get their permits. So he heard my story and decided to help me out. He said he can do all the repairs. And it was like, you know, the angels were saying, oh, <laughs> so, because I remember in that moment, I felt such despair. You know, they're reading off these lists. I've never heard of half these things. I mean, I knew it wasn't in bad shape, but I didn't know it was in danger of collapsing. But basically, well, it, it's like a dangerous type of long list, right? Was. And they just go. It was. On. If you go in there, you could could break your neck. But I got a cash advance from my credit card, which I don't recommend doing, but that was kind of all I knew at the time. You know, I was in school at the, before then I got a student loan with the law I knew. And then I got the credit card. So I got another 5,000, paid them off. And at that point, I was like, I spent 10,000 on this house. I don't know what to do. I started getting some estimates. They were all crazy. I didn't have any money. And I thought maybe I should just sell it. And I got a buyer and someone offered me $45,000 for this place. And I was like, do they know the condition? They seen it. They want to buy it for forty five thousand. I mean, it was a total gut. And they were like, "Yeah." I said, "Well, maybe if someone else will pay forty five thousand for this, maybe I should keep it." So I decided to keep it and say, "I'm gonna figure this out." And serendipitously, my mom is a hairdresser, and she had a client, and and her client had a house around the corner. 
Her client got a refinance loan, did a drive-by appraisal, and her house appraised for $70,000. And I was like, drive-by appraisal? That would be perfect. So yeah. I fixed up the outside of the house. Yeah. I put new windows. I painted. I put a new door on there, and they did a drive-by appraisal. If they had drones back then, I would have been in trouble. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> the roof or the backyard. Yes, it would yes. Be good. I was like... Do they go around the back? So I, I fixed up the back too, just in case. I can I put got five approved. grand up in the front. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So I got approved and I got $63,000 as a line of credit. Love now, it. I didn't know that there were a bunch of liens and there's an old mortgage on there. So I wound up paying another 45000 from out the loan, which is a good thing I didn't sell it because I would have walked away with no money. So yeah. I used what was left over to fix it up and I went through your normal contractor drama. He left. I had to find someone else to finish. But when I did finish, I put two tenants in there and started cash flowing seven hundred dollars immediately. And from that moment on, I have forgot all the drama I've been through, and I saw the power of real estate. And that was the beginning of you know the rest is history. <laughs> yeah, it starts getting that bug going, that addiction going, and yes, in the right hands. Yes. Cool. Yep, seven hundred dollars a month cash flow. I was twenty two at the time. It was a lot of freaking money. Like, yeah, yeah. if I had a raise from my job, I wouldn't have gotten that money. So it completely turned on the light. I understand why that guy wanted to pay forty five thousand for it, and I'm so glad I didn't sell it because what it did was expose me to real estate early, and because of that, I've been able to take advantage and you know grow so much over time. Yeah, I love that. That's so awesome, man. Real estate has literally changed our lives, and without credit we wouldn't have yeah. been able to scale as fast or yep. just overcome so many other obstacles, right? Yep. So mm-hmm. it, it's really a huge blessing. Do you mind just diving in a little bit more on like the numbers of that? Just the whole from beginning to end, what was the rehab cost? So he had quoted me at 25000 which was like, I had a little bit less after my loan from that. Uh-huh. And so after I paid him about twenty, and it was like almost done is when he left. And so... I actually used his day workers because the day workers were saying that he wasn't paying on sets. I said, I'll, I'll pay you guys. So I paid them to finish the job. So I think I spent about 25000 total. And back then, that wasn't like a burr strategy. So I didn't do a refinance till a few years later. So basically, I probably spent 63 plus the 10 I put in, which is 73 So I, probably, I spent more than what it was worth at the time. Yeah. But because I cash flow, that was all I, I saw. I cash flow $700. So theoretically, I made my money back and then some. And then I bought another duplex after that right away. And eventually, like two years later, I refinanced that first house again and was able to pull out like an additional 10. It wasn't much, but I needed, I needed the cash to finish the second house. Sure. Okay. So like, that first deal, what year was that? That was in 2004. So now that house is actually paid off. Yeah. And it's probably worth maybe 180 Love it. Yeah. Cool. So at this point, what does your portfolio look like and what are you focusing on right now? So I have mostly a lot of small multifamilies. I have a couple single families in there that I bought early. I've sold a few of them off. Well, I focus on- Those are like mistakes, right? Like we got single families too. And I'm like, ugh. Yeah. Yeah. So I I have a single family that was my great- great grandmothers. That was like my third property. That was a, a whole ordeal too. I assumed her mortgage. I assumed her mortgage and I paid her a thousand dollars. She had a, she got her mortgage during the, the subprime loan thing. And so her interest rate was 27%. That was insane. And that property was actually how I discovered the birth strategy. When I assumed her loan and I paid her off because the interest rate was so high, I was forced to refinance. And when I, mean, I refinanced- yeah, You'd have to. Yeah, yeah that's crazy. So, so, right, so when I refinanced, the house appraised for $70,000 and I got to pull out like 60. Yeah. So I paid off the old loan and I got like 20,000 in cash. And that was how I kind of discovered it. And that was when I started buying more properties with the credit cards and refinancing and paying them off. And then I discovered hard money loans I coupled the credit cards with the hard money loans. I started buying much bigger deals. That's why I started buying the triplexes and started cashing out a whole lot more money and cash flow more money. So that's kind of how I grew and how it, my portfolio turned into a, a lot of triplexes. You know, I try to I try to leverage, you know, the vacancy factor because the houses cost so much. I didn't want to be stuck having a huge mortgage to pay when I had a vacancy. So, you know, if someone moves out, I still have the two other people in there to help pay the mortgage. And usually two tenants in a triplex, it covers the mortgage and the third person is like extra money. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of mine in Ohio will 
typically even just like one tenant will do the trick, do the job, just like yeah. barely, right? Um, so yeah. not how you should be underwriting when it comes down to like capital expenditures or might cover some of the vacancies and percentage like that, yeah. but you know. Yeah. So yours is a bunch of small multifamily too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Four units and under is typically what yeah. I focus on over in Ohio as well as in San Diego. But to make it work out here because it's all million dollar properties and so forth. You cash flow better in Ohio. Well, they cash flow better in Ohio, 100%, but we do, to make it work out here, we're doing Airbnb, so short-term rentals. Yeah. And in fact, it actually brings in a lot more. Yeah, I haven't done Airbnb. I'm like old-fashioned. I try to do most of my work up front with the buying yeah. and the then the rehab part. And then I want the management to be passive. So I, I know Airbnb is making a killing, but I just prefer that part to be passive. No, that's so smart. I love it. So with your strategy, how many doors do you have currently? So I still have a few under construction. The ones that are occupied are about 90. And I have like another 30 or 40 that are under construction. Good for you. I love it. That's so awesome. So that obviously it sets you up, but it really starts setting up your family and generational wealth as well. Oh, they'll be set. As long yeah, as yeah. I, teach them, I try to focus on teaching them mindset and accountability, my kids. And I'm really hoping that I can teach them to be good leaders. That's, I think yeah. that's the main part is just the mindset and being and believing that all these things are possible. I think one of the reasons why I was able to be this way is because my dad, he was a therapist back in the day. And we had a nice house in the suburbs and I had nice birthday parties. And so I kind of got to experience a good life. Yeah. And then once I divorced, things got a little hard for me. And uh, I've just been kind of you know, striving to get back there and having that good life again. I'm, I'm trying to get to the suburbs. I haven't gotten yeah. back there yet, but that's, that, that's my goal. My next house is going to be in the suburbs. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Good for you. That's so cool. So with your strategies, I mean, you got 90 doors that are you know, active right now so with tenants and so forth. You have a property management company or team? Yeah, that you so I had tried several property managers, probably about four. It was usually after I had a baby. I just needed help and they are terrible. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no one's going to watch for money like you. They take forever for turnovers. I was getting so many issues with them. They were like, take the rent from one house and pay the water bill on another house when the tenant was actually supposed to pay the water bill. I'm like, why, why would you do that? I need this money to pay the mortgage. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go after the tenant for that water bill. So they were making all kinds of mistakes. They were frustrating me. They were frustrating the tenant. And so we decided to do it in-house. So we used the same program that they used. We set a lot of our tenants up on automatic payments. A lot of our savvy tenants will do like a maintenance request through the app. Other ones still call, like the older ones still call. So we've been able to manage it pretty well. But now that we've gotten, like between me and my husband, we're almost at 200 units. And so we have started hiring. He has a couple of VAs. I have an actual assistant. I do want to transition and get a VA. So we're trying to convert it to passive. I've been the active investing for so long. I'm kind of tired and I want to transition it to passive. So I prefer teaching in-house exactly how we run it versus relying on a property manager because we need turnovers just like that. We find other tenants like, like that. So yeah, we think in-house is better. And whenever I do my mentorships, I'm going to teach them how to do it too. It's really not that hard. We, we no. do a better job. Yeah, I can't agree with you more. Like we've gone through the same process. We've tried hiring out in the past and they're like criminals. So yeah. We, for maintenance is crazy. Yeah. So we ended up just keeping it in-house and building systems around it. And we screened just like yep. a bank. So very. Mm -hmm. So what kind of software are you using for the management? I use building them. I know people use Appfolio or build them, but we use building them. I forget why we picked it over Appfolio, but they probably do the same thing. Yeah. But, yeah. Very good. Yeah. And then, so how old are the kids now? Sounds like they have a job uh, coming up soon if they're- right Oh, now. I wish. I wish. I really want her to handle my social media. Yeah. <laughs> my oldest is only eight and yeah. I have an almost two-year-old and a four-year-old. So they're, cool. they're still pretty young. Yeah. 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 Give them a couple more years. <laughs> yeah. A few more years. Like yeah. she, she's on my tablet. I'm like, you want to have all these apps, all these, the social media down pat. You want to yeah. get into this- <laughs> Because I don't really like technology. I'm a, older on the spectrum of tech. And I'm surprised that I did go Instagram though. I got on Instagram a couple of years ago and I've gotten these reels together and I have one go viral. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm getting the hang of it. I love it. I love it. I'm the same way. So yeah. you and your husband both have 
two separate type of real estate investment We're separate. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're separate. We have a couple together that we just use for the household bills, but for the most sure. part, we invest separately. Yeah. I started my own portfolio years ago. I don't want to mix things up, so I we just you. do better. Yeah. <laughs> we both have our weaknesses, and so we help each other here and there, but for the most part, we do invest separately. Cool. So I get this question a lot. I don't know if you do, but a lot of people out there wonder or ask the question of like, how do you invest or work side by side with your significant other on a regular basis? And I don't know if that's like the daily, you know, what you guys do, because you guys do have two different portfolios, but yeah, I mean, we, it's we real estate. It it's in the same yeah, backyard. We, so yeah, real estate is really a tense endeavor, especially when there's problems and both people really have to be on the same wavelength. And when you're not, it just causes issues. And I mean, I've heard couples getting divorced over a rehab, you know, it's really tense. And so we bought like 10 properties together. We did have a lot of arguments. So we just decided to invest separately and things have been better (laughs) because we both have strong personalities and we were just clashing a lot. We were just, you know what, let's just do separate. It was a hard decision to make. It's like, we're not breaking up. We're just investing separately. That's all. <laughs> and we're both, we're both thriving separately. So I'm just as happy for him when he has a big purchase. He's just as happy for me. And it all goes into, you know, and helping the family. So it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I love it. That's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any like words of advice for somebody out there that like wants to work with their significant other or like they're just not on board? Or... You're asking the wrong person. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah. I do think it's good if you have clear roles and that you're really sure that you are comfortable with with these decisions later. Try to make sure no one is doing more than the other because when someone gets tired, you'd be like, well, you're not doing this. You're like, well, you didn't tell me you wanted me to do that. So I think you should just establish clear roles and make sure they're kind of fair and everyone is happy with the roles that they're doing. They don't want to do anything that they're not happy with doing. So, yeah, no, that's so that's good. Perfect. I always say like full communication, full transparency with each other is like for any relationship, friends, yeah, family, loved so ones, cool. like it's the most crucial thing. And then I meet a lot of guys that are like trying to drag their wives into something that well, they're not. I'm okay with that though, especially yeah. if women aren't familiar with it. Cause sure. I know a lot of women who were hesitant at first. And yep. then when they did get involved, they're like, Oh, I pretty like this. It's cool. I like the, the design part or they, or they, they're good with the details and numbers. Yep. So I think it is good if they try to introduce their wives to it and if they don't like it, fine, but you know, just try. Yeah. I always try to tell them like, you know, stop focusing on that or like trying to, you know, uh, drag anybody to anything. Go, go, go through, like show the success, like figure it out yourself. Yeah. And then afterwards the proof is in yep. the pudding. They're going to be attracted yeah. to it. You know? Yeah. Show them the success. Don't like harp on the bad things until they're yeah. convinced because it'll That's be like, good. I told you, I told you this wasn't a good investment. Yeah. I told you it's real estate stuff. Someone so was like, this is bad. This is bad. I told you. So no. So hide all that stuff at first. Yeah. 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 Show them the good stuff just so yeah. they can see the, the proof in the pudding. Just like you said, they have to see the results and then they'll be like, oh, okay. Yes. Real estate is great. So yeah, I think you should do it that way. I love that. Cool. So you've done a ridiculous amount of deals at this point. You've been in it for years. What kind of learning curves like come to mind right away that were something very pivotal for you to not make those same mistakes again and and something that the listeners could really learn from? Well, I always recommend people not do a learning curve that is too steep because you get overwhelmed. Real estate, I keep telling people, I know people say real estate is passive, it's easy, just do this and do that, but it's really not. It's not that easy. It takes a lot of discipline, a lot of of delayed gratification. It takes, especially to go through our rehab. If someone's doing the birth strategy, the rehab is probably the most challenging part. And I say, as a new investor, do a cosmetic rehab. That learning curve is not that bad, but you still might get frustrated because you have to learn how to deal with your contractors. You got to learn how much this stuff really costs. You have to learn about surprises. Do something basic like clean, paint, flooring, new kitchen, maybe a new kitchen. Like don't rip everything out though. Yeah. <laughs> Keep everything where it is and just like, just be facing or, or paint the cabinets. Keep the learning curve slow. 
Yeah. And so that you can make it. And then once you wrap your head around other things, you can gradually keep, keep going. For me, my first property was at Total Rehab. But because I was young, I didn't have a family. I didn't have a high pressure job. I could only focus on that and not let other things overwhelm me. If I was a new investor doing a Total Gut Rehab with my family, with other dramas and stresses, it probably wouldn't have been the same. So oh. I think everyone should do what they're comfortable with first. I know on Instagram and other places and HGD, HGTV, Everyone is loving to rip everything out and put everything new with sparkling this and recessed lights, but just work your way up for that. People just want to run before they walk. Just take your time, do a light rehab, make sure you like it, and then gradually go better because that learning curve, if you go to sleep, you'll get overwhelmed. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. At the end of the day, there there are certain levels to it and you'll get more comfortable as you go yeah. through it. But in the beginning, like I Everything's was- cool. Yeah, I was young, dumb, and crazy, investing 3,000 miles away, and oh, okay. did a, a full gut, and oh. and got screwed that? over with contractors, you know, five Good different contractor. contractors, so it took over a year, and thankfully, I bought a triplex that was a light rehab, oh. you know, so that, that kept That's me afloat at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. But. Yeah. The main thing is finding a good contractor. Once you're set with a good contractor, then you can start doing more heavy rehabs. But the first thing is just meeting a good contractor, establish a good relationship between you two, and then growing from there. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you about contractors, where you're finding them, how you're building that. But I also want to touch on it for just a quick um quick second, you know, the leadership skills, I think you brought it up earlier as well, just you want to develop your children to have strong leadership and strong mindset. And when I was, you know, first getting started trying to manage contractors, I realized quickly mm-hmm. that my leadership skills sucked. So yeah, yeah, really yeah, like I really had it's to really start, I had to step back for a second <laughs> and like dive into the the education of learning well, how to guide. That you noticed that. It's great that you notice that because a lot of people don't realize that their leadership skills suck and that's why they can't control their contract. That's why they can't control their tenants because they're not being good leaders. Yeah. So that is really important in, in managing your teams and managing the tenants. They are like clients and you have to have good skills and good mindsets to do that. I always recommend how to win friends and influence people because that really teaches you how to treat people yeah. and it teaches you to see their perspective and so you can see what that person wants and you can, can come to, to solutions that better both of you. Most people are focused on me, 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 and not focused on what the tenant wants and what the contractor wants or their concerns. But if you work, can work out things that benefit both of you, things always work out better. So that is where the good skills come in with leadership and people skills. And real estate yeah. is nothing but people skills. You know, stocks, it might just be about the numbers and, and reading about companies, but real estate investing is 100% about people and relationships. The better you are with people, the better that you'll be. That's so good. That book is like, it's so simple, but it's gold. Like it changed, it gold. yeah, it changed three different relationships in my life, like instantly yeah. after I read that. And I was like, oh man. It's a classic. And you have to keep reading it, keep reading it until it really becomes who you are. Yeah. Comes who you are and you don't notice. Yeah, always be positive. Make people feel important. Don't criticize people all the time. When you do criticize, make sure it's constructive and yeah. that you do it with candor. Because if you always give, you know, honest appreciation, which is what they tell you, they won't think that you're just trying to criticize them to make, to make them feel bad. But they'll know that it's to help them. So there's so many good points in that book that I always point out to people. Read that book. This world will be such a better place. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, so true. I love that. Yeah. So is there anything that you've done over the years besides diving into awesome books like that to really develop your leadership skills? I also like that book, And Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. She teaches you how to have difficult conversations and having conversations with tenants and contractors is nothing but difficult conversations. You know, I had a situation the other day with my maintenance guy. I do section eight rentals and we have inspections. So he was there the other day fixing all these things just so we could pass inspection. Yep. And he went there for the inspection just to make sure everything was smooth, but the tenant didn't want him to come in for the inspection. He's like, you know, whatever. So he, the inspector comes out. He's like, did we pass? The inspector says, yes. So I'm like, great. I get a notice that night, find out we didn't pass. And I was like, hey, we didn't pass. Did you notice these couple things while you were in there the other day? He was like, what? He told me that we passed inspection. I was there the other day with her. Why didn't she point out things? She probably pointed these things out. Why didn't she do that? I was like, oh, people are just the way they are. 
And then I thought it was dark, but he sent me this like long text later on that day and was like, this is really bothering me. So I gave him a long description. I said, this is what it's about. People don't like having uncomfortable conversations. For some reason, the inspector did not want to tell you that you failed because he didn't want to hear you say, well, why did I fail? Why did I do this and that? She didn't want to tell you about all these other repairs because she didn't know how you were going to react to this and that. It's all about them. It's not about you. And this is why they will continue to be in the position that they are because they can't have difficult conversations. They make extra work for people. You know, you have to go back there and do stuff. They have to come back and inspect. This is why they will be in a position. So don't let it bother you. It is not your fault. It's all about them. Yeah, that's so, so good. That yeah. it's, it is like, frustrating. Hey, I can sleep now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, and, and dealing with people, tenants and contractors and th- these people in the city and regulations, knowing that these things, it lets me sleep at night. I'm like, it's all about that person. When someone gets mad at me about something random, I just like, it's just emotional. It's just how it is. So yeah. I don't take anything personally. And I feel like that's how you have to be when you have such a portfolio, when you're managing people in teams, you really cannot take things personal. You gotta be like, that was their, that person's problem. They can't deal with this because of that so it helps me sleep at night and deal with a lot of things <laughs> i love that you got to have tough skin in this game for sure you so. do you do you do if yeah. you get upset and emotional about the, the random things you're not going to make it in business so where are you finding your contractors currently is there like a certain spot that you're getting the best of the best so what i do is i had a contract i was using for about 10 years and he really took me to success. But the last year I'm gonna tell him this, but he's going through a divorce. And so he was not able to work on my last few deals, which really messed me up. Cause I usually keep a pipeline of properties for him. Like I close on one and I get more into contract. So I'm really backed up, I have about seven and they were big jobs. So because of that, I had to find all new contractors, which is hard. It is hard to find good contractors. You have to keep going through people until you find one. And him, I went through five people before I found him. So yeah. I I find people through referrals, but usually they don't work out. I find them through, yeah, (laughs) yes, because you have to find a contractor who works for you, works good for you. So everyone is different. Not everyone can work with me and I'm okay with that. I'm not a good coach for everyone and I'm okay with that. So I actually find a lot of my contractors on Craigslist. (laughs) I know that's like a misconception that Craigslist people are bad, but there's not. There's a lot of hidden gems diamonds in the rough on Craigslist. People have good talent, but they don't know how to go out there and get people so they're on Craigslist. So I find contractors on Craigslist. I teach them how to get licensed and insured, and I try to teach them how to build their own team and kind of just take over over the project. So that's kind of what I did with my first guy. He was a small guy. He wasn't licensed and insured. And once I realized that he was good and that I could like rehab him, that's what I started doing with my other guys. So yeah, I found at least two good crews on Craigslist recently. And yeah, it works out good. So I have a whole script that I tell people, like tell them this in the ad, list pictures. And when they call, talk to them and see what they're about. So you can yeah. find really good people on Craigslist. Now, at this point, do you know, obviously you've seen the before and after of good and bad contracting, but yeah. do you know for yeah. a good majority so like, of what a deal needs. Yep. Yeah. So basically the biggest thing that a contractor has to have is outside motivation. If you get someone who's older, doesn't have a family, doesn't really care, then he doesn't really have the motivation to be there every day working. You get someone who's young, has a family and kids and families to support, they're going to be there every day working on your job. And I like getting people that are small on crazies because they don't have a lot of jobs and they'll stay on my job and work on it completely. If you hire a GC, they are usually managing various different jobs and he's going to fit you in wherever he can. So that's why I like to go on Craigslist and kind of find just like my people and keep them working on my stuff. Yeah. You know, I wasn't anticipating that response truthfully. I know, know, I know, I know. Yeah. Right now, right now we're in the season of finding new contractors as well, or just handyman to be able to get some stuff done. But we've always gone off of referrals because any other time that I try drifting off and going a different route, I, it usually yeah. bites me in the butt, but I like it. It's a smart approach. It is. Yeah. 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 There's, there's a lot of good people. I mean, there, there are some bad ones on there, but once you talk to them, you can kind of discern who's going to be good and bad. And then you just try them out with something small. Try them out yeah. with something small, see how it goes, and then start giving them bigger stuff. Don't give anyone who's brand new a, a whole project, even someone who has been referred to you. You, you guys might not match. Start out with something small and then take it from there. As far as leads go, how are you typically pulling in your leads currently? Well, I have a lot of wholesalers that I've been working with. I think the best 
I know a lot of people source their own deals, but I just don't think that's my strength. Strength is doing the renovation part. And so what I did was I built up good relationships with wholesalers. I networked. And once they found out that I could close because I use hard money lenders and use credit card, which is like just easy cash. Once I realized I can close, they just, they feed me deals. Has there been any uh, tips or tricks? You know, we teach credit. We've been able to do the same thing, purchasing properties and building huge credit lines and the whole nine. Mm -hmm. But is there anything that you recommend to the audience that has helped you be able to build up big credit lines or just get more credit? I think, you know, people are caught up in the business credit right now. I tell people that it doesn't really matter that much if the bank knows that you're refinancing and paying those cards off that are on your personal credit, as long as you don't have any late payments, that's the main thing. Don't have late payments. For me, it hasn't been a big deal. When I maxed them out, my credit score might dip to like 660. Yeah. But because I have a relationship with my lender already, and he knows that we're going to pay them off from refinance. He doesn't really care. He's just looking at the actual report and not the score. I feel like a score is really for when you're applying for things online and the computer is kind of doing the analysis. But when you have a person who's looking at your application, they're looking at you as a whole. They're looking at your portfolio. They're looking at how the property cash flows to qualify you for a loan. I do most of my loans with commercial loans. So they make sure the ratios of cash flow are good versus, you know, my ability to pay it back. So I think it's important for people to focus on not having any late payments. Don't focus so much on whether it be in personal or business. Just get whatever you can apply for. Ask for increases often. As soon as you pay it off, I would wait a couple months and ask for increase. Get cards who often offer 0%. My Citibank card always offers 0%. Also, I have a discover card. They offer 0% a lot. And when you do your budget, I usually work my interest payments in with my budget. So a lot, $10,000 to go strictly towards the payments of the car, just so I can maintain them on the renovation. And I don't use leverage unless I know I have a team in place and I know I can refinance afterwards because you don't want to be stuck after your 12 months expires with, with a high interest rate after that 0% is over. So always have your systems in place and make sure you can refinance afterwards because this is temporary. You refinance and then you pay the cards off and you do it over, all over again. Yeah. So that whole Dave Ramsey approach out there. Of, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you and me both. I'm like, man, it's a certain avatar that he's talking to, right? And it's not yeah. somebody that's savvy because yeah. there's a huge difference between good credit or good debt yeah. and bad debt, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I feel so like you're... he's extreme just to get people out of debt. But then once you get out of it, it's time for you to pivot and like learn from someone else about how yeah. to invest and grow. And you yeah. need leverage to grow. It's really helpful. Capital is really what keeps us from growing. And once you learn how to use it, you learn how to manage it, which is important. You can use it and grow and grow your wealth. And eventually, you know, in 30 years, whatever, it can be paid off. And then you have these assets here that's worth hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of dollars. So learn how to use credit, learn how to manage it and buy real estate. So good. Yeah, that whole approach on the Dave Ramsey side is really it builds in fear and it's really geared towards somebody that is spending too much on bad debt and finding themselves in a bad situation, right? So after you go through that course, if you're yeah. in that situation, then really yeah, break that, call break that fear off. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Learn about that. OPM and yeah. make a new relationship with that. Yeah. That's, that's too good. I love it. Mm-hmm. Well, you've already built so much. You've created so much, which is awesome. I know you got a family and, and just some awesome things ahead, but where do you see yourself in the next few years or what kind of goals do you guys have either just individually or you and your husband together for the family. I would love to hear where you guys are heading. Well, like I said, I'm tired of the act of real estate investing. I'm tired of fighting with contractors. I'm really trying to transition to more passion. Yeah, yeah. The systems and being passive and people have been asking me to teach and mentor. So I think I'm going to transition into that, helping people, teaching them, doing some speaking engagements. And once I take a break, because I do actually like real estate investing, I think I'll do larger multifamily. Oh, yeah, that's exciting. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time so much. It's really great to just see another boss woman in the space and just crushing it, you know? So yeah. you're doing very, very awesome. I'm excited to see like what the next five, 10 years looks like. I'll definitely be following along and, and watching. But for anybody out there that doesn't know how to either connect with you or social media links, websites, whatever. Do you mind just blasting that out there for a second? 
I'm very active on Instagram. I put my tenant drama on there. I had a squatter recently that I've had him for like over a year. I finally got him out. So we're all uh, celebrating. I have that kind of drama. I got my contractor drama. And I tell you like how I, I fix these problems too. So you can learn from there, be entertained from there. I'm doing these reels. And um, the, I have one go, I think I told you I had one go viral. So um, find me on Instagram, Janelle, J H A N E L Wilson, W I L S O N on Instagram. I'm in the process of making a website. I'm going to have courses and teach you exactly how I do my strategy using credit, how I do section eight, and hard money lending with commercial loans. So that's my strategy. And I'm going to start teaching it. I love it. Well, I appreciate you, Janelle. Guys, if you reach out to her, she is a boss in so many different areas and you can learn so, so much from her. I just have some awesome notes right now and this was just like 40 minutes. So I definitely reach out to her, support her and, and follow along. Definitely looking forward to what you guys have coming out with the courses and stuff like that in the future. It's going to help out so many people, which is very exciting. But if you guys want to get a hold of me, you can find me at Instagram. It's branded Elliot Investments. And then on facebook.com forward slash Brandon Elliott Investor. Otherwise, if you're looking for credit repair done for you services, then creditrepairmobile.com. Otherwise, if you're really just interested in being able to get educated, join our mastermind group for Credit Council Elite and understand how to fix your own credit very quickly or build up several six figures in funding or even up to seven figures in funding on business credit and then be able to leverage it into real estate or Walmart automation oh. stores, all that mm-hmm. fun get stuff, that get, yes, get the, get get the that. free travels, then what you want to do is check out and you can apply if it's a good fit for creditcounselelite.com. With that being said, make sure you guys hit that subscribe button so you get the newest notification every single Monday and leave a review. Let us know how you guys are feeling about it. But I appreciate you guys all for tuning in. Janelle, you are the best. I appreciate you so much. God bless. Having this fun. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Till next time. This has been another episode of Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast, brought to you by Brandon Elliott. For more information, please visit BrandonElliottInvestments.com. Also, please don't forget to like, share, and leave a comment below. Thanks again for joining. Until next time, God bless.